Okay, um, thanks a lot for joining this webinar. Um, I'd like to welcome all of you. This is the second webinar of the One Health and Water Sanitation and Hygiene Network. Uh, my name is Christina. I am working for the Swedish University of Agric Agricultural Sciences. And we also have a few more people here from the network secretariat and members of the network. Um, as I mentioned, this is the second webinar of the network. Our first webinar was um, held in March this year, and that one focused on zoonosis, food production, and wash. Um, but today we will focus on how effective wash can prevent infections and reduce the emergence of antimicrobial resistance. So we will hear three different presentations, um, looking at various links between antimicrobial use, antimicrobial resistance, and wash and the importance of applying a One Health approach to tackle antimicrobial resistance. Um, as mentioned, the webinar is organized by a newly started One Health and WASH network. It was started this year. It's funded by Formas and SME Global. Um, the network secretariat is hosted uh, by the Stockholm Environment Institute. And we have Sara Lisson, and we have Linus Dragerskog here from the Stockholm Environment Institute. Um, and in addition, uh, we have um, uh, Sara Lisson here, who is from the Swedish University of Agricultural Sciences, who is hosting the Network Secretariat in collaboration with Stockholm Environment Institute. Uh, we also have collaborating partners from Burkina Faso, from Mozambique and Kenya in the network. Uh, and our partners represent uh, academia, governments and NGOs. Uh, and uh, the network is holding a series of open webinars this year. Um, there will be another one coming up uh, in a few months' time, focusing on the environment. Um, some practicalities, uh, please keep your microphones muted throughout the webinar. Uh, we prefer that you post questions in the chat, uh, and uh, you can post questions in either French or in English. Um, the uh, posted questions will then be read out to the presenters uh, after the presentation, so we will open up for one or two, person, uh, one or two questions after the presentations. And then we will have a session at the end uh, for additional question and answer. And you're super welcome to post your name, your affiliation and country in the chat so that we see who is with us today. That would be very nice. Uh, and as I mentioned, there is a link uh, in the chat to the web page of the network uh, where this webinar will be posted and also where our first webinar, uh, the recording for our first webinar is posted. So with that, I would like to start with a presentation. Um, first, we have our first speaker is um, uh, Dr. David Sutherland, who is an environment health professional and is working as technical officer for the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations. Um, he has worked many years in water sanitation and health for WHO um, before moving to apartheid coordination on One Health and has also been acting coordinator for the AMR Matic Multi Trust Fund. Um, they will provide an introduction to effective wash to prevent infections and reduce the emergence of AMR. David, please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Good morning and good afternoon, everyone. Um, I hope my voice is going to hold out. I have a bit of a, a chest infection, but um, uh, very nice to be with you. Um, just bear with me while I get the um, technology sorted. Okay. So um, thanks, Christina. Uh, as Christina was saying, I've, I've um, worked quite a lot with WHO and FAO and the Quadripartite over the last few years, um, initially in WASH and environmental health. Um, and the last four years on One Health and, and AMR. So a lot of what I'm going to be sharing with you is, is from the organizations that I've worked with, but the, uh, the comments, uh, the, the stresses of the, the presentation are sort of my own personal ones based on uh, experience. So just gonna really give an oversight first, sort of going through the, the problem um, as far as WASH and AMR is concerned. Uh, just um, showing what WASH is uh, within this context and what WASH has to do with AMR um, and what does improving WASH require in the context of AMR and One Health. 
and then just a few examples of kind of things that are, are going on to uh, try and address the situation. So as we all know, the AMR situation is really quite serious, according to the Graham study that was published in The Lancet earlier this year. AMR is thought already to be the leading cause of death globally, with low resource settings having the highest burden. And they're going forward to the financial and the uh, social standing of millions uh, is really going to be quite serious. And there is really growing concern on the impacts of AMR to animal health and welfare, to food security and the environment. It's really being driven by increased resistance and increased infections. Uh, worst case scenario by 2050, a doubling of infections without any kind of controls in place. And there are many common infections like urinary tract infections, pneumonia, bloodstream infections are without uh, effective treatment, life threatening and increasingly becoming resistant. The diagram on the right uh, is, is adapted from um, a report of the Interagency Coordination Group uh, on AMR. And whilst you can see on the top two boxes, the main areas are overuse and mis misuse. There are many contributors to an, uh, antimicrobial resistance that come from WASH, from discharges to the environment, um, and from uh, infection prevention and control measures in uh, crop production and food production. So this is a, a, a cheerful slide from a WHO website, just again, really sort of demonstrating some of the nature that one in 10 patients get an infection while receiving care in hospital. More than 50% of surgical site infections can be antibiotic resistant. Um, and of course, this has been compounded by COVID, but has COVID has also presented many opportunities when it comes to uh, management of health facilities. Um, the Director General of the UN said, do not call a healthcare facility a healthcare facility if there is no wash. This is a, a birthing room uh, in a um, small healthcare facility with uh, no wash whatsoever. So what do we mean by wash? Wash really has inputs, it has uh, internal processes and it has outputs. So the inputs primarily are water supply, uh, the internal processing and management uh, is related to hygiene, uh, and we're looking at human facilities, whether that's housing offices or recreational facilities, human healthcare facilities, and agricultural production facilities, so farms, whether this is livestock, crops, or uh, aquaculture. And then the outputs from the facilities that are uh, in question, so sanitation and uh, wastewater out into the environment. So this is essentially what we mean by WASH. WASH has its own uh, targets under the Sustainable Development Goals. The uh, huge contribution, important contribution that WASH takes uh, has in ensuring improved health uh, and uh, well-being of uh, the global population is, is understood. So there's targets for safe use, safely managed drinking water services, safely managed sanitation and hand washing services, and safely treated wastewater. Um, so one of the, the areas, just want to sort of show, uh, the, we call these shit flow diagrams. This is quite a lot of work is being done to identify what is safely treated, what is safely managed and what isn't um, when trying to assess progress against the targets. So what we have here is a flow diagram for, this is for a small town. These diagrams, uh, hundreds, maybe thousands, have been prepared for towns and cities and, and localities. Looking at the source, the containment of sanitation waste, the emptying, the transport treatment, and the reuse and disposal. And depending on how that is managed, uh, that could be seen as safely managed or not safely managed. Um, this is uh, water closets, sewerage, centralized systems, on-site facilities, or open discharge and open defecation and going into uh, a domestic environment, into agricultural fields or into receiving waters. So these, um, those shit flow diagrams in many ways, the antimicrobials 
follow that wash flow. So you have uh, antimicrobials going into animal populations and into human populations, and then being processed by humans and uh, going out as unmetabolized, uh, well, maybe uh, unmetabolized um, antimicrobials from human, human waste, active antimicrobial residues from pharmaceutical industries and unmetabolized um, antimicrobials from animal aquaculture and crops going out into the uh, into the environment, water environment in particular. So in the context of AMR, what does wastewater contain? So the main areas of interest to us when it comes to AR, AMR is that there are disease causing pathogens uh, within the wastewater um, going into humans and plants and animals requiring treatment with antimicrobial agents. So hundreds of millions of cases of diarrhea each year in humans are treated with antimicrobials. Universal access to wash could reduce this by at least 60%. And then there's resistant microorganisms with low pathogenicity infecting vulnerable populations or transferring their genes to pathogens causing infection. So th this figure is slightly out of date now and likely to have increased, but uh, the last survey done was 14% of humans carry globally, carry ESBL producing E. coli in their feces. And then, when, and then the uh, third component of interest is the active residues. It's not known uh, the, about the wastewater from pharmaceutical uh, manufacturing, um, but it's, studies have shown that up to 80% of antimicrobial agents taken by humans and animals are excreted as active residues. The challenge here is that wastewater treatment is often insufficient or not possible. Uh, the level of treatment required is not possible for context. So in practical terms, what does WASH cover in different contexts? So we're looking here really at community WASH, uh, at WASH in healthcare facilities and WASH in agriculture and aquaculture. So in terms of water supply, this is very much looking at standard of service. Uh, which is looking at facilities uh, for water supply, plus what is the drinking water quality source? Is it protected? Uh, what is the quality of the water going in? So this is for drinking and, and uh, hygiene usage uh, in human facilities. Uh, it could also be in food production facilities, but also is irrigation water, fisheries water. For sanitation, again, looking at standard of facilities, plus on and off-site use, collection, transport, and disposal. Um, and on the agriculture side is also looking at wastewater from livestock production and processing. Hygiene is not really just hand hygiene, uh, although that is an extremely important element of infection prevention and control, um, but it's really seen as hygiene of the facility as well. So hygiene includes hand washing, facilities and services, at community level and in healthcare facilities, and also looking at the presence and uh, implementation of uh, IPC protocols for staff, and would include biosecurity measures in WASH, in agriculture and aquaculture. The waste management is really looking at solid waste. And so again, similar to sanitation is looking at disposal, collection, transport, and, and the offsite disposal. With health care facilities, this also looks at infectious waste and sharps. Uh, and on the agriculture side, this can, as well as production, it can, can include the animal remains from slaughterhouses or wet markets. And then environmental cleaning is looking at the cleaning of the facilities. So looking at having uh, protocols in place, uh, responsibilities and schedules for management and standing operating procedures for workers and for facilities. So in terms of prevention and control of AMR, so prevention refers to strategies and interventions to prevent emergence, transmission and spread of AMR. and can refer to the prevention of infections overall, as well as across One Health interfaces. Control refers to minimizing trans transmission and spread of AMR within and across species and or the environment. So source control relates to strategies and interventions designed to prevent potentially harmful pollutants entering wastewater systems. 
This can also include the disposal of unused antibiotics into wastewater systems. I think a lot of us are familiar with the, the concept of, of One Health. Uh, this is the quadripartite own perspective. Uh, quadripartite being FAO, UNEP, World Health Organization, and the World Organization for Animal Health. Um, so it's integrated in a unifying approach that aims to sustainably balance and optimize the health of people, animals, and ecosystems. Um, so really, the One Health approach is saying that there are definitely specific settings, specific issues, specific concerns that relate to agriculture. Uh, in terms of the location, in terms of disease issues, uh, and issues such as prudent use in animals and access to vet services. And similarly, within human health sector, that there are specific settings, uh, specific issues, and specific concerns. The main issue around One Health is looking at those shared uh, settings, shared issues, especially related to the potential for horizontal gene transfer, and shared concerns in terms of waste management and uncontrolled spillover. So having worked in WASH for 20, 30 years, um, WASH is really, uh, as a sector, it's really extremely used to intersectoral working. And so in many ways, those involved in WASH are uh, very active and very open to engagement. So I think you will find in many cases, those who are working uh, in WASH are very responsive uh, when trying to look at some of these uh, issues. There is, however, very rarely, if ever, a ministry for WASH. The WASH components tend to be very uh, disparate and spread out amongst many agencies. So water supply could include local government, private sector or domestic. Hygiene is often facilities management, uh, can be line ministry agencies under health, industry and agriculture. Water and waste management is also tends to be local government, but quite often it will be a different agency or institution from water supply and private and domestic. But it's very much a sector ready and willing to engage. So just want to um, finish off with uh, a few slides really about um, what is being done to address some of these issues. So there was quite a significant publication uh, produced um, a couple of years ago now. There's a technical brief on WASH and wastewater management to prevent infections and reduce the spread of antimicrobial resistance. So this is um, uh, available on the WHO website and uh, I think uh, on other quadripartite sites as well. Um, and there are various other pieces of work that have been done by tripartite and by tripartite partners um, on issues around uh, AMR in um, environment, crops and biocides, on AMR relevant legislation, uh, on impact of the climate crisis and how that affects it and uh, environmental dimensions, as well as specific management tools and reporting for facilities such as uh, WASHFIT and the practical steps for WASH uh, in healthcare facilities. So there are many uh, initiatives for working with um, healthcare facilities and these have been very much stepped up as a response of COVID and the recognition of the importance of all sorts of measures to prevent the spread of infection and the management of hospital waste. So in many ways, COVID has been a huge burden, but it has demonstrated the huge need for dealing with these issues at facility level. So going back to the, the sort of original diagram of contribu contributors to uh, AMR, key improvements required are to increase access to clean water, uh, sanitation and hygiene, and to improve these prevention and control practices in healthcare facilities and farms, to treat discharge of waste from healthcare facilities, pharmaceutical manufacturing and farms, and to improve infection and disease prevention and control and reduce transmission of resistant pathogens in food production, in storage, distribution and preparation. So just a few examples of kind of work that's being done 
uh, in both the human and the agricultural sector. So this is um, information from a global progress report on Washington healthcare facilities. Um, the practical steps that were set up, there were eight steps that were felt to be absolutely essential to ensure effective management at healthcare facilities. So is to conduct situation analysis and assessment, set targets and define a roadmap for improvements, establish national standards and accountability mechanisms, improve infrastructure and maintenance, monitor and review data, develop the health workforce, engage with communities, very important at uh, small level uh, healthcare facilities, and conduct operational research and share learning. So a lot of uh, work has been done in many countries in this area on embedding WASH standards into national quality efforts, on risk-based WASH improvements, on monitoring and reviewing data and implications for policy and practice, and engaging with communities. Um, and on the agriculture side, uh, primarily uh, examples now from the poultry industry, there's a lot, quite a lot of work that is being done by Fleming Fund and the AMR Multi-Partner Trust Fund. The Multi-Purpose Trust and Partner Trust Fund is very, um, fairly new. So uh, there are new initiatives that are underway. There is an IPC and WASH network. Uh, so participating countries are sharing experience. But some work that has been started and is getting going is, is from Indonesia, where FAO RAP drafted and the government in Indonesia finessed uh, an assessment tool, which was a merger of WHO's infection prevention and control assessment framework and FAO's layer farm assessment tools. And importantly, this was used as a starting point for national certification of uh, production facilities. In Kenya, um, farm biosecurity guidelines for dairy, poultry and pig value chains uh, have been developed and veterinarians and paraprofessionals have been trained on their use and also given instructions and guidance on how to disseminate those guidelines to its stakeholders within their respective networks and areas of responsibility. And in Zimbabwe, farmer field schools are used to promote adoption of good animal husbandry practices. This is improving biosecurity and the hygiene standards in broiler value chain. So there's a lot of work that is sort of getting underway uh, and, and there is uh, there are other countries that are interested to participate and that uh, developing in this area. So that, that's it really from my side as an overview. Um, just want to give you a, a quick advertisement for, I'm, not, I'm sure most of you may have seen it, but in case you haven't, uh, the quadripartite is starting later today. Uh, at 2 p.m. Central European time, a series on antimicrobial resistance in the environment. Uh, so it'll be a webinar series. I think it's a four webinars. So the first one is understanding the basics for national action. So this will go into a lot more detail uh, than I have done. Um, I think it's a one and a half hour uh, webinar and a substantial presentation on the basics of environmental AMR and the risks and the overall principles and terminologies, um, understanding of key sources and approaches to prevent control and strategies to strengthen the involvement of environment. So I would uh, strongly recommend that uh, as um, more detailed uh, follow-up to this presentation. That's all from me for now, thank you very much. Thank you very much, David, for a very interesting presentation. I don't see any questions yet in the chat, but I see that Linus is raising his hand. Please, Linus, um, over to you for questions. Yeah, thanks, thanks, David, for that uh, super comprehensive presentation. Uh, I'm from the wash, uh, wash sector and also working with the uh, increased uh, reuse and recycling circular economy uh, uh, field at the moment. And, you know, the, I mean, it's concerning that we have these active residues in, in human excreta, as you said, up to 80% of the antibiotics are found in, in the urine and, and the feces. And then different 
sanitation systems either will transmit these active substances to water or to soil if, if we if we recycle. Could you say something about what happens to these active residues in, in water or in soil if there would be a pre preference to, to have it to soil uh, compared to water? Uh, very, very good question. Um, I mean, neither neither is uh, ideal. I mean, I would have to say that the eighty percent is very much uh, an, an estimate. Um, and but I think really what we could say is that um, a significant proportion is there as um, active residues. I think one of the issues is is very much about the the half life um, of the the residues um, and that would have an impact in terms of, of management. It's, I, I don't feel confident to give you a specific answer, as you can probably tell by the way that I'm speaking. I would encourage you to attend the meeting later in the day, where there are some significant experts uh, there who would have more uh, information uh, to give on that side. But I think, um, certainly, I think that the there are a whole series of symposia that have been going on over the years on the environmental dimension of AMR. And a huge proportion of that work has been on agricultural waste. The last one was in Hong Kong. The next one is in Sweden later this year. And a whole series of fascinating papers that came out of that. Now, an awful lot of that was looking at the impact of uh, composting and of uh, effective sort of treatment before uh, putting onto soil and to contaminating, uh, uh, to um, fertilizing uh, crops and, and others. So I think that there is certainly a strong argument for containment before uh, going for um, fertilizing and, and use on that side. But I can't give you a definitive answer, I'm afraid. Three, uh, three hours time, you'll get a much more definitive answer. Thanks a lot, David. Uh, we have uh, two additional questions in the chat. I think we can group them in one. Um, it's uh, it's uh, one question about if is the sanitation safety planning tool a good approach to AMR for small towns and rural areas, especially? And also a follow up question is the sanitation safety tool the same as the wash fit tool for healthcare facilities by WHO? Uh, yeah, excellent questions. Um, Certainly, I, I was quite closely involved with sanitation safety planning in India while based in Delhi. And uh, the tool uh, is an extremely good um, approach because it looks at all the various risk groups uh, and the nature of the risk and to address those risks. So that would include farmers, it would include those working in markets, it would include those consuming the product. So it's very broad uh, ranging in its risk assessment. So it's uh, extremely good. We were doing, uh, one of the areas where we were doing some training and piloting was the East Kolkata wetlands. And what was really interesting there is that there was a wastewater treatment plant installed and farmers were begging uh, the operators of the wastewater treatment plant to release a significant proportion of the wastewater in an untreated condition, because it's an extremely valuable resource before it's treated. By the time it's treated, an awful lot of the nutrients and goodness is has gone. So as well as the, uh, the pathogens uh, and the um, uh, antimicrobials, you also have many, many good things in there. So it is a, it is a real challenge. And with the increase in fertilizer prices going on now, the, the free, Fertilizer that comes from wastewater is, is hugely attractive to farmers. So it is a real challenge, but the sanitation safety planning definitely identifies the risk groups and the nature of the risk. So yes, they are very good. And it's a similar approach. Wash fit is similar in many ways in that you are identifying the, the risks and then you are seeking then how to manage those risks. Thanks a lot, David. I think with that, we don't have more time for questions right now, but I know that you're staying with us until the end. 
and we hope yeah. that there will be some additional time for questions at the very end yeah, of, of the webinar. Um, so thanks a lot. And with that, I would like to move on to our next presenter, uh, which is Dr. Innocencio Chongo from the National Institute of Health in Mozambique. Um, Dr. Innocencio is a veterinarian. He is also a PhD fellow in tropical diseases and global health. Uh, and he is coordinator for the National One Health Platform in Mozambique. And Dr. Innocencio will present to us uh, antimicrobial uh, use in intensive farming and resulting resistance in the environment in Mozambique. I saw you already started with your presentation, Innocencio. Please move on. And the floor is yours. Thank you, Kristen. Uh, good, 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 good morning, everyone. I'm going to start uh, this uh, presentation from Mozambican team. This is real uh, about sharing uh, the small uh, stats that we have regarding to the antibiotic use in intensive farming uh, and the resulting resistance in the environment that we think that it's a potential public health implication in Mozambique. Moving. All right. So uh, this is Mozambique who <laughs> doesn't know Mozambique. We are in southern of uh, Africa. We have um, uh, the uh, population approximately uh, 8 million, uh, where 45 is um, uh, population young than uh, 15 years old. And we have uh, this representative in terms of uh, different species of animals. Uh, we bring this uh, just to focus on uh, the poultry uh, uh, number. So uh, Mozambique is uh, particularly vulnerable uh, to the effect of uh, disease because uh, approximately 81% uh, of the country um, labors, uh, it's based in agriculture. So they are continuous uh, contact with the animals and the, uh, uh, the, the soil. So we have uh, some uh, water disease uh, that uh, are representing uh, very big hospitalization cases in uh, uh, Mozambique. Uh, this information is according to the annual reports and uh, uh, some studies that are already developed in Mozambique regarding to the watch and uh, uh, the disease that uh, are, water, are waterborne. So we have issues regarding to the poor water supply system, the weak sanitation and drainage system, and the lack of personal hygiene. It's important to say that this is not only for Mozambique. It's, uh, we can find across uh, all the uh, Sahara uh, uh, Africa. So we, we have the, the shortage of potable water as improved water sources are limited to the urban area. Even these uh, water that are limited to the urban areas, we have some studies and the annual reports that uh, showing us that we, they, they are not uh, facing the the, the quality that is, re is recommended for human consumption. So the sale of home bottled water, uh, the reuse of the bottles, which are the often collected in garbage and the containers. It's important to say that uh, in um, a different uh, 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 city, in a different capital of the, the, the city in Mozambique, uh, many people, they used to uh, sell, they reuse uh, a bottle. Uh, so the, the process of watching uh, those bottles and uh, the bottling water for sale does not uh, follow the minimum hygiene uh, criteria. And uh, several stats, uh, even here in Mozambique, uh, they have shown that uh, most bottled water uh, that are sold it, 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 it are not, uh, can present a good physical uh, quality, but uh, in terms of chemical and the microbiological quality, uh, is are not following uh, the human consumption uh, required. So the consumption of uh, this water uh, can contribute to uh, the increase of waterborne uh, disease. It's important to mention that uh, Mozambique uh, 
they 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 mainly uh, farming uh, mainly for poultry. They they a lot a higher number of farming mainly for poultry are not uh, automatically are, are still manual, and the, many of them they use those uh, uh, reuse bottle, so increasing the the the, the uh, higher rates of occurrence of the disease in the animals and uh, consequently the use of uh, uh, antibiotics to uh, treat the disease. So we have another issue relating to the proximity of people and uh, the animals. As I said, that 81% of people, they practice agriculture and they use the animals uh, to prepare the soil. So we have issues regarding the climate change. When we talk about climate change, we know that Mozambique, for example, was hit by the two cyclone in 2019. And uh, many of uh, uh, places out of the seats, uh, uh, mainly in the rural areas, uh, they use uh, the water uh, well supplies to have uh, uh, the water to, to drink. So uh, during this period, there are risk of, contam of water contamination and the uh, risk of developing the waterborne disease. Um, so we have issues regarding to hygiene, food preparation, and uh, consumption uh, uh, practice. I will not take along uh, this uh, uh, picture because it seems uh, like the, the 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 one that we presented with the previous speak, showing the very uh, important role of the the, the people that uh, take the, the drugs while they are seeking and the animals that they be administrated the antibiotic when they are seeking. And those anti antibiotics, uh, when they are not be used, they can, uh, they, they are be, uh, they, they, are, they can uh, be uh, discarded and uh, uh, contaminate the, the, the soil or contaminate the, the plant. So it, it and they become the risk for, for the, the, the human. I will not take a long time, was explained. So I'm bringing this picture just to show uh, these very important issues. This uh, real, it's uh, a Mozambican picture. We can see this area. Uh, this it's uh, any area where we they discard uh, the 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 solid resi re residues. So these solid residues uh, they come from different ways. And while there's a, a a rain, we can see here the 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 font, the source of water. So this source of water is buried with uh, people and the. Uh, the animal, so it is it's a, a, a high risk of um, uh, consumption of, of um, uh, uh, water that are contaminated with uh, pathogens or with uh, uh, antibiotic. So this picture shows uh, the, the the floods that Mozambique were uh, flowing were uh, were were, were hidden in two thousand. Uh, uh, 19, as we can see, all the soil um, um, uh, is covered by the water and the source of the water. As we said, that many of people they are using the water supply wells. Uh, it's covered by this water that it can bring the, the risk of the people. We bring this picture just to show and to make uh, sure that uh, we have uh, some people that are uh, preparing the milk uh, in the rural areas. And uh, we can see uh, this milk is prepared in the field and uh, there's no uh, a very good condition of uh, the water. So they are using the, the water that are coming from the, the wells and uh, increase the risk of uh, uh, antibiotic uh, resistance. So this picture, it's a real picture that we took and uh, unfortunately I can't show the source of the water. So sometimes uh, those people, when they are selling the chicken uh, in the market, uh, when the chicken are selling the chicken in the market, they, because of the lack of information, they, they are using antibiotic uh, in the drinking water for the chicken and the chicken are be sold for the people. The same thing uh, occur in the goats, as you can see uh, in this uh, picture. Those pictures are taken from uh, any 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 municipal market. Uh, we have issues regarding to the floods, as I said, I mentioned before that Mozambique is uh, currently hit by the the cyclone, and uh, we have uh, um, uh, the condition of the contamination of the 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 the, the source of uh, uh, the water. Uh, we have some study that uh, shows us. That many, many, many uh, well supply, many water well supply, 
were contaminated and uh, we, we they found a higher rate of uh, uh, echol in the, uh, that uh, well water. So uh, we are coming to the uh, antibiotic uh, uh, resistance. Uh, it's better to say that, uh, as we know, all of us, uh, the antibiotic, uh, they are be used in the human or uh, in the animals. So in the animals, uh, many of them, they are using for the disease treatment or some they are using for the growing the animals. Unfortunately, this is common in uh, many developing countries to use the antibiotic for, uh, uh, pro to promote the growing of the uh, animals. So in agriculture, at the global level, um, we found uh, uh, the class, the same class of drugs that uh, are be used in the animals, like tetracycline, um, beta lactams, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, are the same that we uh, we find in the in the in the in the in the human and the animals. So uh, we have approximately seven hundred thousand people that are dying uh, each year, and if we don't control this. Uh, the, 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 the estimated uh, for 2050, showing that the number, they will, it, will, it will increase. So Mozambique applied uh, to develop the national action plan for antimicrobial resistance. And then we have uh, uh, those strategy objectives. We highlight uh, this that say that we, the reduce of the incidence of infection through effective sanitation, hygiene, and infection prevention uh, measure that uh, recognize that we, if we have uh, the good, if we follow the procedure for the water uh, sanitation and the hygiene, we can reduce the use of uh, anti antibiotic because we will reduce the, the risk of infection and that will reduce automatically the use of antibiotics. So reducing uh, the uh, risk of res resistance to the antibiotic. So Mozambique is a member of uh, the GLASS since uh, 2008, we started to uh, share the, the data uh, from uh, uh, AMR. So those are some studies uh, that we developed in Mozambique. Uh, we have uh, uh, quite a good number of the studies that uh, have been uh, developed in Mozambique. And then uh, the majority of those studies, they are showing us that there are big, uh, uh, there is a big uh, relation uh, between uh, the quality of the water, uh, the risk of contamination and the use of antibiotics. Uh, what we have in Mozambique and in uh, main African countries is people, when they get sick, they go to the health facility. And the main of health facility, uh, they are using empirical uh, treatment uh, for uh, antibiotic. It means when they go, uh, as they don't have the capacity uh, to develop the different methods of uh, diagnosis, mainly uh, for those cases that are not common, uh, they just perform a, a malaria uh, a diagnosis. So if malaria is negative, uh, they prefer to use the antibio antibiotic. Uh, so uh, um, increasing the risk of the uh, antibiotic resistance. And instead of that, uh, people, they used to do their own treatment. Uh, so they just take the antibiotic and not following the, uh, the, the procedure. So it means uh, if we have a, a very good quality uh, of the water, we can uh, reduce the, the 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 we can reduce the risk of a of the contaminate contaminate uh, drinking contaminate water and develop the disease, and we reduce the use of um, uh, uh, antibiotic. In the sense, minute remaining. Sorry? One minute remaining. So uh, the antibiotic are, are used in a uh, livestock where they uh, where they use it to treat uh, the the disease, as I said previously. Many of a uh, developing country they use it for, uh, for growing. So uh, we we can find this uh, 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 this antibiotic. Uh, uh, it depend by the food uh, of animal, the intensive and the extensive farming. It's important to say that Mozambique is not so well for intensive uh, farming, but for poultry, uh, different people they use the intensive farming. It that increase the use of antibiot antibiotic. Uh, we have commercial and industrial. In Mozambique, we, we are doing the same. 
and uh, we have uh, the, the lack of clean uh, legislation. It means we have the documents that people, they need to follow for, to use the antibiotic, but not all of them, they are following it. This is a start that we developed in Mozambique that's a focus, uh, focusing uh, on uh, our, 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 our workshop. Uh, that shows us the resistance uh, that we found in a different, uh, a different place in the supermarket, informal supermarket, uh, or, or formal supermarket and the slot, the slot house. Uh, those results show us that there's a, a resistance that, that uh, until a resistance that are coming from the consumption of or the use of the antibiotic that are the same uh, group that be, can be used in the uh, animal. So it's important to say that the, the article mentioned that mainly this uh, contamination can be related with the type of the water that will be used uh, during the uh, uh, production in the in the in the in the farming. So those are the the results that show us that up to fifty percent uh, they found the uh, re the, the, the is resistant to the this group of the the farmers. So we had. Um, uh, in, for the supermarket showed the higher resistance uh, profiles uh, than the slaughter's house, and uh, there is no uh, difference uh, that we, we noted. In conclusion, we would like to say that say, uh, the antibiotics are good to be used, uh, but we need to follow the procedure uh, that can come from the veterinary or that can come the medical doctor, and we avoid to use the antibiotic by uh, uh, ourselves because we can uh, pollute the, uh, the environment uh, by discarding uh, the antibiotic or by using, uh, not using well this antibiotic. This is what we would like to uh, present uh, for Mozambican team. Thank you. Thank you very much, Innocencio. Very interesting and comprehensive presentation. Uh, well, I think we have time for one short question. I don't see any questions in the chat but there might be someone in the audience uh, who wants to ask a quick question. I don't see any hands. Ah, Linus, please over to you. Yeah, hi, Innocencio. I could just ask uh, the question since, since you have identified uh, WASH as one of the strategic uh, axes for your AMR work in, in Mozambique, has that also translated into strengthening wash budgets or uh, strengthening uh, action in, in the fields? I mean, is it translated into, into more money for, for the wash sector in Mozambique, you know? Sorry, can you come again? I did not hear well, sorry. Yeah, sorry, I, I was wondering if, since the wash wash as a prevention tool for, for infections and reducing the use of antimicrobials has been identified in Mozambique, has that also been, do you see any effect in the, in the work that the wash sector is carrying out? Are they, yes. do they yes. get strengthened budgets, for example, from, from, from this recognition? Yes, very good question. I, I see that, the, that it's, um, it's uh, a, a very big uh, issues in Mozambique uh, because in, instead of uh, the advocacy activity that would be developed by the uh, government sector. Uh, Mozambique applied the, in 2016 for the global health security uh, agenda and they developed the na uh, national uh, plan for security health. Uh, and the one of the point, it's uh, the, the water, hygiene, sanitation, and the uh, uh, food security. So, it means that it's something that we are taking uh, as a priority in Mozambique. And uh, about the budget, uh, this plan, will, we, we, are, we are doing the review now and they will be submitted the, within September to the Council of Ministers uh, so they can be found the, all the activities using the government uh, budget. So this is a, a really uh, 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 issue to that we are be taken by the government. Over. Thank you very much, Innocencio. That was a, a good addition to the presentation. Um, I see that there was one additional question in the chat. 
we don't have time for that now, but please stay on with us after the next presentation and we will hope that there is some time, sufficient time for additional questions. Um, with that, I would like to uh, invite uh, Dr. Florence Mutua from the International Livestock Research Institute, who is our last presenter for today. And Dr. Florence is a scientist. She is working on animal health and food safety. And, and she will talk to us about sustaining hand washing post COVID and what this means for infection control and AMR. With that, I would like to say over to you, Florence. Thank you, Christina, for that uh, uh, introduction. You will allow me to put off my video because of the uh, connection. Yeah, so my talk is about um, sustaining hand washing post COVID and what this means for infection control and uh, AMR. So, as a way of uh, saying how my presentation will flow, I will have a small introduction, which I will just be very brief because much has been said by the previous presenters. And then I'll give some highlights from the, the work we did on COVID-19 mitigation and implications for food safety. A few slides on the hand hygiene and tie that to antimicrobial usage and AMR. And then uh, one slide on uh, uh, to conclude. We know that AMR is a, is a present significant threats to public health uh, uh, globally. And uh, the burden has been uh, demonstrated and shown in previous uh, studies. And we know that uh, from the global action plan on AMR, reducing the incidence of infection through effective uh, sanitation, hygiene and infection prevention measures is one of uh, the key points highlighted there. Overall, looking at the bigger picture, WASH interventions can address uh, several of the sustainable development goals uh, whose target is 2030, the year 2030. And thinking more of uh, um, um, in the line of food safety where I work a lot on, uh, we know that diarrhea is a serious public health uh, problem. Uh, this is more of a problem, in, especially a problem in developing countries. Um, but the good thing is that we know that hand hygiene um, can reduce the real episodes. And this has been demonstrated in a number of studies, including the one that I given there in the reference. Diarrhea disease agents are a frequent cause of foodborne diseases. And you know that based on the studies by the World Health Organization and the World Bank, the burden associated with these diseases is quite huge um, and is more affects the um, uh, developing countries here in Africa, regions in Africa and Asia, and is more so uh, in the children under the age of five years. Um, so there is that uh, uh, not equal distribution when it comes to the, the burden of these diseases. Next slide. So I'll tell you a, a little bit about the, the study that we did on COVID-19 mitigation uh, and effects on food safety. I'll start by saying that COVID-19 is not transmitted uh, through food. There has not been any evidence to, to link that so far. But we know that uh, frequent hand washing, social distancing, and face masks uh, were among the available strategies that were promoted at the time when this problem started. And at the same time, we know this helped a lot in containing this spread of the, the infection as more work on the uh, vaccine uh, studies uh, continued. So our study looked at how enforcement of the COVID-19 mitigation measures impacted on food safety uh, in the region of East Africa. So we, we contacted the uh, uh, food, sa food safety experts in the region. Um, these are experts we had worked with in previous uh, food safety projects here at Tiri. Uh, we were able to book appointments and interview five experts from um, this out of the six uh, experts that we worked on in the countries. We were not able to talk to people in uh, in Rwanda, um, and 
as a, as, as a summary of what we found out from this study, I leave out the, uh, the problems that are touch on the bigger food, safe, uh, food systems disruption, and just focus on the ones that are on food safety. So one of the things that we came up with um, uh, linked to food safety was the issue around bulk purchasing during that time. And this was a problem because uh, the people do not have enough spaces to store the products. And then also the issue of uh, having and trust with these suppliers. Um, these are people that uh, the suppliers that uh, made it um, increase the risk of consumers buying foods that were not safe and therefore um, increasing the risk of getting foodborne uh, infections. And then the issues around transport delays, and this is especially the, the transport and the border points, um, because the, the people that were transporting, transporting these products needed to stay for a long time to do the COVID testing. And then also, again, um, the disposal of products that got spoiled, it wasn't clear how that was uh, uh, dealt with. And then, of course, because of working from home, there were limitations in ensuring the usual uh, food inspections were done. So uh, my, my talk is more on the, the, the hand washing. So I picked a few of the things that came out relating to hand washing and hand hygiene. So for example, in Kenya, there were regulations that uh, businesses, uh, especially the food outlets, including the food outlets and the restaurants needed to install hand washing facilities. So it was a must that they do that. And then also we saw a lot uh, um, um, from the government, both the national government, but also the county government and the partners uh, coming out uh, and providing water tanks just to facilitate and make it easier for people to um, access water and therefore wash their, their hands. So these are just a, um, uh, some pictures and materials that I got from uh, online resources as I was preparing for this uh, presentation. And then there is not just in the public places uh, where we, we saw changes in uh, the hard washing behavior, even the families themselves at home. Uh, we, we got uh, some experts saying that some of the families were, were keen on installing hand washing stations in their homes. And this was more so for them to wash hands, especially when they go out of the compounds and come into the, to their homes. Sanitizers were also uh, recommended and mentioned uh, by these experts, uh, but they were thought to be expensive, especially to the uh, low income uh, uh, categories. In Burundi, um, there was a mission of uh, the government coming in with the, the partners and trying to lower the cost of the, the soap, just to make it uh, more accessible because it doesn't make a lot of sense to um, pass the message that people need to wash their hands thoroughly with the uh, running water and soap when the soap itself and other ingredients that are required are not available. And then there was also indications that uh, the informal markets were not well supplied with, again, with the water and soap. So it was difficult for the uh, for people living in those settings to be able uh, to, to be able to uh, practice proper and hygiene uh, and washing. And then also there were mentioned about compliance issues, um, including even people coming out and refusing just plainly to wash their hands when requested to do so by people manning these uh, hand washing stations, especially in the public places. Uh, and also some of them using the water for non-intended uh, purposes, although good purposes, like for example, people, I think there was a mention of uh, people wanting to just wash, the, to use the water provided to wash their hands when they are going to eat, but not uh, for frequent uh, washing of the hands while at the markets. And then, of course, in, in, in Kenya, there were complaints over the management of the, the water tanks that were supplied by this uh, national government, uh, because it wasn't clear who, whether it was now still the national government who was supposed to take care of these water tanks, or it was the county governments who had to take care of the tanks that they sent, the national central government had provided. So then, uh, then specifically on the hand hygiene itself, eh, this slide is just to highlight the, that there are many opportunities that our hands get contaminated uh, with the uh, 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 
pathogens that uh, could impact on our health, both at home, um, in school, in hospitals, and other places. So this uh, slide was just to demonstrate that. Uh, just to say that uh, hard washing uh, is an opportunity to present an opportunity to break the transmission of these uh, pathogens. So hand washing is a simple measure, uh, but not everyone can access it. I saw this document they, 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 from the UNICEF uh, um, website that uh, three people in 10 do not have a place in their homes to wash their hands with, what, with water and soap. So this is a message that needs to be borne in mind as we go out to uh, sensitize people to, um, or, uh, or as initiatives are, developed to sensitize people to comply with the proper hand washing with water and so on. And then I, uh, my little search on the internet, I found that there are quite a number of uh, um, initiatives meant to encourage or promote hand washing behavior. So one of them is the Global Hand Washing Day. I, I, I wasn't able to know it, to, to confirm whether that is, um, the, whether this is the same one that I, I think was celebrated uh, this year. Oh, I saw it was celebrated this year, and uh, May 5th. And then there's also a very good hand washing uh, um, handbook, which is a, a very good resource, especially for people that are training people to adopt these hand washing practices. Next. And then there is also another comprehensive uh, uh, initiative um, on hand hygiene for all. Um, uh, which is uh, promoted or driven by WHO and UNICEF. It uh, defines uh, short, medium, and long-term measures uh, that can be adopted to uh, ensure uh, hand hygiene in the communities. And it covers a number of uh, areas, uh, uh, political behavior change, promoting supply, um, uh, supply of hand hygiene products and services, uh, policies and strategies by uh, uh, governments, uh, institutional arrangement, looking again at the financing, uh, monitoring to, to, to measure usage and uh, capacity building. And this, uh, what this initiative uh, covers is uh, hand hygiene, both at homes, uh, schools, healthcare, public places, uh, places where we work and other places. So it's a quite a comprehensive document and uh, I put a link there for those that might want to read more about, about it. I am not so sure how much has been done that, but maybe uh, people in the audience uh, are more familiar with the initiative. So as I, as I um, just about to finish, I just want to say that uh, frequent hand washing with soap can reduce risks of infection and lower transmission uh, disease transmission rates, and therefore avoid unnecessary use of uh, antimicrobials. Again, at microbial use, we know is a key driver of uh, antimicrobial resistance. But uh, I think what is missing more is uh, just emphasizing on the linkage between AMR and hand hygiene and clarifying that as well as to those that are promoting uh, this. And then AMR is best addressed through one health approach. I think David clarified that. So hand washing should be promoted as an approach that can be utilized in, at all settings to prevent spread of uh, infection. And I take note that the um, hygiene is not just hand, uh, hand, hand hygiene, but also the, the, hygiene, the, the environment where all this is happening, as mentioned earlier. So just to, to conclude, I would just say, I want to say that uh, um, the level of hand hygiene which we all witnessed during the pandemic is what we are proposing to prevent future uh, pandemics or uh, disease outbreaks, but also ensure um, um, we prevent also uh, other infections, including the ones that are related to food safety. So already we have seen that there is a rich resource base which we can use or which can be used to promote hand hygiene. The ones specifically for hand hygiene, but also the ones that David explained overall on the, on the wash. So to address AMR, we need to prioritize hand hygiene as we do for the other wash uh, uh, intervention. And we need to think different because the, this is something that is so close to us, yet not so many people have access to it. And we need to consider approaches that um, particularly encourage uh, behavior change 
uh, her home with communities, hospitals, and other places. Um, there was a list that I gave earlier from the, one of the initiatives. I think prioritizing uh, what should come first in that list will be key so that uh, as resources are limited, then a, a key target starting point can be realized. And I think that was my last slide. So thank you so much and over to you, Christina. Thank you a lot, Florence, for that presentation. Um, I haven't managed uh, to follow the chat. Uh, if there are any specific questions, I think we can now take a few questions for Florence first, and then we can open up the floor for additional ones. Um, are there any questions specifically focusing on the presentation from Florence? Uh, I see um, that David Hardwin. Um, you have your hand up. Um, please, David, I think uh, we'll leave the floor to you to start with. Uh, thank you, Christina. And thank you very much, Florence, for a really uh, clear and interesting uh, presentation. Um, and uh, I, I work in Myanmar and I work in the animal health sector. And certainly during the pandemic in Myanmar, we saw some really good initiatives to encourage um, better hand hygiene. You know, even communities widely putting up hand wash basins at bus stops, for example, with uh, running water and, and soap. And that was that was good. But the area I'm particularly concerned with in my work is improving this kind of practice on farms, you know, at the uh, livestock human interface. Uh, and uh, it's a struggle because especially uh, nowadays with increasing costs of inputs, and pressure on farmers, uh, you know, harder work for farm workers. It's very difficult to actually bring about the behavior change which you are suggesting is required. So I wonder if you have any thoughts on what can be done to actually achieve that behavior change, uh, especially in the animal production sector, because we, we sort of know the theory, we know the need for better wash, but it's proving quite difficult, at least in Myanmar, for us to bring about that change at farm level. So grateful for your thoughts on that. Thank you. There is what now, Christina? Yes, please, Florence, go on and respond. Yeah, so yeah, you're right. Um, there is what we see and there is also the challenges that uh, like uh, there when we talk about the real uh, behavioral change for actual um, for us to see the actual thing happening. So I know one of the things that I came up, came up when we were doing this uh, work, yeah, the, the COVID study work, yeah, was uh, somebody told me somebody from the, the Kenya Dairy uh, working with the Kenya Dairy Board. Yeah, he told me one thing that they've always advocated for uh, outlets to keep um, hand washing station outside just at the door. But it had never, they never thought it would ever happen. But COVID made them know that it is possible. So I think with that, it's just saying that um, it is possible for people to practice a high, heightened level of hygiene at home, especially now the hand washing that we are talking about. And the authorities know it's COVID made it uh, um, raised, uh, make, made it clear that it can happen. So I think it's now for the authorities and the others that are working to improve this, to improve wash and other practices, to see, um, because they you don't have to uh, push them. What is, what, are, what is it that we need to consider in the interventions that we come up with that would allow for a, a progressive change? We may not want to, we may not be able to go there right away, but there could be a progressive Progressive approach that can be promoted and help us to get where we want to, to see. Maybe it will take time. Over. Thanks a lot, Florence. I think we are, we are all struggling with behavior change. Uh, how do you bring about that? Uh, how do you make sure that uh, your target audience is seeing the incentives uh, for changing their behavior? Um, we have additional questions in the chat, and I'm now opening up to all our presenters. Um, we have a question if there is a cost effective way of testing for AMR at processing and consumption points. Um, I don't know um, if uh, 
David and Asensio or Florence, if either of you would like to respond to that question. Innocencio, do you want to say a few words on that in response? Or David? Yeah, I just wanted to make one point. I had actually deleted a slide to, to save on time. Um, but the, the big challenges that we have in water resource scarce areas, there's so much of wash is interlinked. They're not separate things. And that in order to have effective hand washing, you need to have water. And without water close to the point of use, then it is really difficult to, to, uh, to manage. So it, it's really a general point, not necessarily specific to this, uh, the, the farm point, but really um, it, it's a real challenge in some areas where water is, is is in short supply to, to manage hand, hand hygiene. Uh, and it's really, to make hand work, you need water as close to the point of use as possible. Because we're all quite lazy and we don't want to walk anywhere to get hold of water. But uh, yeah, so it's just a general point. Thanks, David. And I know that there are some trials there to make sure that you can pass by, or you have to pass by the hand washing station. And that will, that will kind of, remind you to wash your hands. I mean, there are ways to build in uh, more um, frequent hand washing uh, in facilities and so on. Uh, but I think there's much more that can be done on, on improving the access to the hand washing. In a sense, do you want to say a few words on, on testing for AMR processing consumption points? Yeah, yes. Uh, hi, Christina. Hi, everyone. So we, 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 we don't uh, have any testing for MR at the processing or consumption uh, point uh, right now. Yeah, we don't, we don't, we don't have, we don't perform here in uh, Mozambique. So I don't have uh, uh, quite experience. I don't know if it, Diocleciano, I think it's here in the call. It needs to comment on, Dio. Hi, Diocesian. There seem to be no response. Yeah, in yeah but we, 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 we don't have uh, any experience regarding the testing for MR at the uh, construction uh, point. But I think even if we develop this uh, without any um, education information and communication package, it can be a big challenge because you can do the testing for MR at the processing or consumption point, but you have the chain of the, the, the food or the water until the, the, the people that they are going to consumption, to have the consumption of that product. So it's a big challenge. We don't have here in Mozambique, any, I don't have experience regarding to this. Um, and I fully agree with the previous speaker regarding the comment. Over. Thanks a lot, Innocent. So I think what we are all finding challenging is that there is no fast testing, uh, neither for bacterial diseases or for AMR. Like, it takes time, and that means that you normally get the results with a few days delay, uh, and that, that is an issue we are all facing when it comes to guiding treatment. Um, and, and I know there's a lot of research ongoing and finding uh, types of rapid testing uh, that can assist physicians and veterinarians in, in guiding the treatments. Um, we have another very tricky question out, uh, and that is, is there a fit for purpose treatment considering AMR? Um, or a fit for purpose treatment considering AMR too, would that make sense? Uh, or would it make sense, wouldn't it? Um, David or Florence, do you want to uh, respond to that? Um, well, yeah, <laughs> excuse me. It is a tricky question. Um, I guess you've got the three components of uh, the requiring is whether it's the pathogens, 
or whether it's the, the low level, um, not so pathogenic, or whether it's the anti, it's the active antimicrobials feeding. Um, I think if you if you are taking out the active antimicrobials, then you are looking at normal wastewater treatment in in any other situation. Um, so I, I get it, it's it's a more complicated question than it even appears uh, by itself. So it's quite tricky. But I think you know if you're looking at, at bacteria bacterial waste then then composting and then some form of treatment and and storage before use is is quite effective the the real challenge with the uh active antimicrobials which is not only is it difficult to test for extremely difficult and very expensive to 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 treat and so really the question there is is stopping the the active uh antimicrobials from getting into the environment in the first place humans have to poop they have no choice but if you're looking at manufacture of pharmaceuticals then you need to be looking there at, at more efficient uh, processes thanks david i think it summarizes that prevention is better than cure right it's saving a lot of money if we can invest more in the infection prevention I think with that, it's already quarter past 12, um, so we've come to the end of the webinar. I would like to uh, say special thanks to our three presenters, uh, David and Asensio Florence, uh, for sharing data uh, in, in, in the webinar today. Really helpful, very informative. I would like to say thanks to all of you who participated in the webinar today, and I hope to see you in our next webinar. And um, to know what's going on up next, please check out our website. And I hope to see you next time. Thanks a lot. Um, thanks. Bye. Thank you, all of. Bye. Thank you. Bye.